every now and then, a film is released that is so confident in its own aesthetic, in its own language, so internally consistent that you feel that every aspect of the film is working towards achieving a single goal. Denis Villeneuve's arrival is acutely aware of the potential of cinematography, of dialogue, of music and sound design, and how these can all combine to create a unique and beautiful cinematic world. A world that becomes more compelling with every scene. In the same way that the language that you speak can alter the way that you view and perceive the world, we view the events in this film through a constantly shifting frame that changes as we begin to understand the language of the film. It is teaching us to view what we are seeing and hearing differently as Louise begins to realise the meaning of her visions. The score, which is by the late Icelandic composer Johan Johansson, is for me the most fundamental way that this language is imparted. The encoding of the language in the score begins early on. When Louise first learns about the 12 shells that have landed on Earth, we hear a deep, metallic drone. A seemingly never-ending sound that is produced by recording the tail end of a note on a piano. Ordinarily, when you play a note on an instrument, you hear what's called the attack, and then the decay. But if you remove the onset, you remove a lot of the qualities which define the instrumental sound. This is why the drone sounds so, for want of a better word, alien. To make this drone, Johansson took recordings of the tail ends of multiple notes played in various octaves on the piano and passed them through a 16-track tape loop, which allowed him to overdub the recording multiple times. The result is a thick sound that's rich in harmonics. The next time we hear this drone is just before we are shown the shells for the first time. But on top of it, we now hear this. Again, an unfamiliar and unrecognisable sound. This is an important moment. We'll come later on to find out that the human voice is a fundamental part of Johansson's score, so it's no coincidence that the first clear and distinct idea in the music is based on sung notes. This is produced by experimental vocalist Robert Ike Aubrey Lowe, but again Johansson has manipulated and looped the recording to distort and alter the properties of the sound. We are not aware of this being a human voice, but it ends up being the seed for the language of the music that follows. What Johansson creates through his score is a new set of sounds that define the world of the shells and of the heptapods. We are hearing new instruments and new colours that are often unrecognisable but are clearly linked to the visual and aesthetic design of the film. When Louise and Ian first enter the shells, as well as hearing the drone and the vocalisation en route to the shell, we begin to hear a new idea. Rising string glissandos which match the shifting gravity as they enter. This is followed by an ominous, cyclical string pizzicato pattern. And then we see the chamber and hear this. A completely new instrument is added to the world. A three note sequence played in multiple octaves made by combining distorted brass, strings, as well as a hichiriki, a double reed Japanese instrument used in traditional gagaku music. This is the heptapods theme. It happens one more time and then for a third time as the heptapods arrive. There was also significant overlap with the sound design. The sounds of the heptapods mimic the score as if they're speaking to each other. At points, it's very difficult to tell what is diegetic sound and what's incidental music. In the first meeting with the heptapods, Louise and Ian learn nothing of their language. But the second time they enter the shell, they and we are given the first glimpse of how they speak, the logogram. And exactly at the point at which the logogram appears, we hear in the score voices, overlapping arrhythmic patterns that cycle and repeat. This is the second example of use of voices in the score, but unlike the first, it is not distorted. It is clear and obvious and linked indefinitely to the Heptabot's language. After this point, voices keep reappearing in the score. They are used when Louise and Ian are shown the logograms which represent the heptapods' names. They appear during the montage which explains what they know about the language, and voices, most crucially, appear at the point when Louise finally deciphers and is able to read the language. At this moment, we hear a version of the original distorted vocalizations that appeared when we were first shown the heptapods' shells. Although they sound distorted to us, they are clear to her. She is able to understand the world that the heptapods inhabit, one that perceives time in a non-linear way. I can read it. This vocal music not only ends up becoming a representation of the language, 
it also maps the process of Louise learning that language. The film, like many aspects of the score, is circular. It ends as it begins. It shows Louise's life in the future with her daughter, in the knowledge of what is to come. And so it also seems appropriate that as the scenes and images cycle, so does the music. Max Richter's On the Nature of Daylight, which is heard at the beginning and end of the film, and the only music not written by Johansson, is also based around cyclic, repeating patterns, and is, in itself, a form of musical palindrome. Johan Johansson has, I believe, created a sensitive, complex and profound score for a film that is in itself a genre-shifting exploration of what it means to be human. He has created a sound world that enhances Villeneuve's aesthetic, that guides our understanding of the narrative throughout, and that ultimately gives life to this beautiful film. <laughs>